Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Our program tonight is co-sponsored by the um, Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School and by the Program on Constitutional Government in the Department of Government. Our speaker tonight is George F. Will. No stranger to Harvard or, or even to the ARCO Forum. He gave the Godkin lectures here some years ago and published the result of them as statecraft as soulcraft in 1983. He's published a book on baseball. He's published four collections of his columns. And most recently and relevant to tonight, he's published the book Restoration, Congress, Term Limits, and the Recovery of Deliberative Democracy. George Will could have been a professor. He's got a PhD from Princeton in political philosophy. And in fact, he has been a professor at Michigan State University in Toronto for a total of three years, I think. But of course, we all know him otherwise. As a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, the Globe when it dares, <laughs> and for Newsweek and many other papers around the country. He's a television commentator on, on ABC. We can see him on Sunday morning, a fast friend of Sam Donaldson, <laughs> an intelligent inquisitor of the prominent. He has a Pulitzer Prize for his commentary, but he's better than that. George. <laughs> George Will, in his elegant and eloquent way, consistently offers the most perceptive, the most thoughtful, the best informed, the best stated, and the best argued comment on American politics as it happens. It's easy for us professors to make suggestions, to provide quotes for reporters, and above all, to see things in retrospect Actually, it's not so easy to do these easier things, but it's easier. But Mr. Will keeps on top of American politics, not all by himself. He has plenty of competition, but he's at the top of those who try to keep on top of American politics. His topic tonight is term limits, a Madisonian reform. There's one other item before I leave. That's this person sitting in the front row here, my friend, uh, Professor Fiorina. Not many conservative speakers come to Harvard. And when they do, they're often required to be accompanied by another person. <laughs> who is assigned the task of showing that the conservative speaker is all wet, lest he be believed by too many tender minds in the audience. <laughs> These conservative speakers need a liberal chaperone. <laughs> now, Professor Fiorina, to repeat his name, does not have this function. Professor Morris Fiorina, Mo, he's called, is a mellowed out Californian, a leading expert on Congress among American, the leading expert on Congress among American political scientists, author of Congress, Keystone of the Washington Establishment, and more recently, direct, uh, uh, Divided Government, and many other things, of course. He's going to start off our question period with a comment and a question. Af uh, 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 that's uh, after Mil uh, Mr. Will uh, uh, finishes his remarks. So I now give the uh, floor to Mr. Will. Thank, thank you very much. Let me begin with a preemptive uh, apology. If I'm even less coherent than usual, it's because I've just come from Seattle, where Tom Foley is suing the people of the state of Washington for having had the impertinence of voting for term limits. He's suing them in the name of democracy. Uh, <laughs> it is good to be back here in, uh, in this forum. I did indeed uh, commit a lecture here that became a book sold by the dozens. Some of you may have... <laughs> It's, it's remaindered in better bookstores everywhere. Uh, and it is also true that I was once a, a college professor 
although I, I don't like to have that sort of flaunted. Um, <laughs> I remember the night that Jim Buckley, my friend Jim Buckley, uh, won renomination in 1976 for the Conservative and Republican Party to be senator from New York, and my friend Pat Moynihan won the Democratic nomination, and over at Buckley's headquarters, Buckley said, I look forward to debating with Professor Moynihan, who I'm sure will run the kind of campaign we'd expect of a Harvard professor. And the, back over at Moynihan's headquarters, a journalist said, uh, Pat, uh, Jim Buckley's referring to you as Professor Moynihan. Pat drew up to his full height and said, ah, the mud slinging has begun. <laughs> uh, Every, um, every sermon needs a text, and my text will come from the national religion of baseball. The, uh, the Orioles, on whose board of directors I sit, uh, used to have a manager named Earl Weaver, a feisty Napoleonic little man about 5'4", who was the scourge of American League umpires and would come barreling out of the dugout in high dudgeon, and he'd stick his nose in the chest of a much larger umpire and shout at the top of his lungs, are you going to get any better, or is this it? <laughs> the American people have asked that about their government and have decided that there is much room for improvement and that one of the ways to do that is term limits. I am convinced that this, the most vital and broad-based mass movement in the country since the Civil Rights Movement, and in some ways a continuation of the spirit, uh, is going to prevail. I believe that of all the voting done in 1992, the voting for president was the 15th most important voting. The 14 more important votes were in the 14 states where the political class, try as it might, was unable to prevent people from voting on term limits. In all 14 states, they passed. In 13 of 14 states, term limits got more votes than Bill Clinton got. In 14 states, term limits got more votes than Ross Perot got in 50 states. Uh, if American history tells us anything clearly, it is that when the American people, by a large majority, want something intensely and protractedly, they get it. And this looks to me like uh, a, 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 a cause who's, that is going to succeed, as well it should as an amendment to the Madisonian system, because it is, as I indicate in the title of these remarks, a Madisonian change, in that it aims to modify surgically the structure of incentives governing behavior in public life, to change the incentives people have for entering public life and therefore the incentives they have for behaving in one way or another in public life. Now, I say at the outset that I am a conservative who came to my support of term limits reluctantly and indeed after having been rather ardently opposed to term limits. And there are four good reasons why conservatives particularly should be skeptical of term limits. The first is that conservatives believe that almost all improvements make matters worse. That's why we are conservatives. <laughs> The second is the doctrine of unintended consequences, which you're all familiar with, it being that the unintended consequences are often diametrically opposed to and much larger than the intended consequences of any social action. The third is that it's a curious reform because you know going in that one of the absolutely certain results of it will be deplorable, and that is the ending of some very great careers. My book on term limits is devoted to two of my best friends and two of the best senators, Jack Danforth and Pat Moynihan, both of which would be gone from Washington already, uh, were term limits to prevail. If you enter my office in Washington, you'll see two photographs and one bust of Scoop Jackson, one of the few heroes I've had in Washington. It is the case that not all long careers are great, but most great careers are long, and this will limit long careers. And the fourth reason to be skeptical about term limits is that the Founding Fathers didn't vote them. And had I been among the founding fathers, I would not have, because, founding, uh, because term limits are indeed an excision from the sphere of free choice, and the good reason for doing that did not exist then. It does now. The difference is the emergence and nature of the modern state. When the founding fathers were uh, writing, and when walking along the river, a city where pigs grazed in Pennsylvania Avenue as recently as, uh, as late as the coming of Abraham Lincoln as president, the idea that anyone would want to make a long career in an unair conditioned city was preposterous facially, and indeed few people did. Back in the Jeffersonian era, politics for those who wanted to make a career of it was very much a matter of musical chairs, and the idea, say, of going from uh, the Congress to the Virginia State Legislature by no means appeared to Virginians, for example, as a step down 
What began to change was, of course, what changed everything in American life, which was the Civil War, which gave A, consolidated for political reasons power in Washington, and gave an enormous impetus to the growth of industrial capitalism and the growth of the interventionist state. After the Civil War, of course, the, the great source of revenue for the federal government was the tariff. And the tariff was, a, in the language of today's politics, a twofer. To impose a tariff was to do a favor to one group, and then to spend the money raised by the tariff was to do a favor for another group. It was the beginning of a great mechanism by which the machinery of the federal government could be turned to the advantage of incumbency. The work of the interventionist state went up, the sessions got longer, and a cult of professionalism in general swept the entirely of expertise, modernity, science, specialization. It was, after all, only 12 years after the turn of the 20th century that we elected a former professor of political science president. Now, I believe that what has happened in this century is an imbalance in the natural constitution. We have seen the presidency grow, uh, swell really, to attain a role in American life at the expense of Congress that I would like to redress and I think term limits will redress. One of the peculiarities of my particular approach to term limits is that I want it not to punish Congress, but I want it to restore Congress to its rightful place as the first branch of government. The modern presidency is not an institution that can safely be relied upon. The president, as a permanent presence in the American public mind, is a modern invention. Some say it began with a specific piece of legislation, something presidents never did before, when he did so for the Hepburn Act, regulating railroads, which he thought was a regime-level question. But it was Woodrow Wilson, who Professor Mansfield rightly identifies as the first president to be critical of the Founding Fathers, who really gave a theory to the Teddy Roosevelt's practice in inflating the presidency. Uh, he was, uh, gave the theory to the progressives and to the New Dealers, the theory that what the Founding Fathers intended was a mistake in many ways. It was Woodrow Wilson who said that a president exists to inspirit the country, to be a kind of constant moral tutor, and to interpret his word, to interpret what the people really want and would say they wanted if they were articulate enough and conscious enough of what they wanted. This led to a kind of increased plebiscitory nature of American politics surrounding the presidency. It has achieved a most grotesque form in recent years in the, the watery Caesarism of Ross Perot, but it is a constant tendency in American politics now that the president is a, a, a repository of the constant will of the American people, constantly shaping and being shaped by public opinion. The problem with this as a, a motor for the American government and as an anchor for our public life is that the presidency is an inherently weak office. By inherently, I mean constitutionally. There's precious little a president can do on his own other than move the country by the power of his rhetoric and by moving the country control Congress. The problem with that is that the presidency, therefore, is a hostage to the attributes of its current occupant. Think, by the way, I'll give you an example. Think that the, the prime ministership of Great Britain was pretty much the same in its power and function under Clement Attlee or Margaret Thatcher, two vastly different people. But the presidency was a different institution under Jimmy Carter in the summer of 1979 and Ronald Reagan in the summer of 1981, just two years difference. What we have seen, therefore, is, it seems to me, reasons to doubt whether we can healthily function as a country with Congress functioning the way it is, Congress viewed by an increasingly dyspeptic public as, a, as an illegitimate institution, uh, Congress needing restored. That was the, really the beginning of my uh, slow epiphany on this subject. I did, however, I mean, I can actually give you a little autobiography here. Uh, I was a in front of a group one day, I've forgotten where it was, and someone said, what do you think of term limits? And I gave the stock Washington answer. I said, if we had term limits, we, we wouldn't have seasoned professionals in Washington, and if we didn't have seasoned professionals, we wouldn't have the good government we've got. Uh, <laughs>
which got me to thinking that, of course, the opposite of the word professional is amateur, and amateur comes from the French word to love, and it means someone who does something for the love of it, which is an acceptable, if eccentric, motive even in Washington. That was the beginning. Just listening to my own language was the beginning of my change. I was also uh, watched and was uh, quite struck by the campaign in California for Proposition 140, their term limits measure for their state legislature and for their congressman. I was struck in the state legislative campaign for term limits that something I and others had predicted turned to be exactly wrong. It was said that the lawyers and lobbyists comprising the parasite class that surrounds any modern state seeking, seeking to use, uh, doing what the economists call transfer seeking, seeking to bend public power for private advantages, that they would relish term limits, we were told, because they would run roughshod over the rookies, the poor innocents who would come in. But when push came to shove, as it has a way of doing in California, the lawyers and lobbyists came out of the woodwork en masse, unanimously and in force, happily futilely, in support of the opponents of term limits, because they are quite comfortable with the long-established relationships they now have with the well-regulated, rented, and house-broken political class uh, with which they cooperate comfortably uh, in exchange for crucial political support. Then I noticed, uh, uh, noticed, it's like noticing the Grand Canyon, uh, <laughs> the, connection, the connection between the inability of the federal government to perform the first function of government, which is to write a reasonable budget, in short, the deficit, and careerism. The deficit is for Republicans and Democrats alike. There'll be not a dime's worth of, well, maybe a dime, but not 20 cents worth of difference between them on this. The deficit is the principal instrument of incumbent advantage because it is the deficit that enables the political class in Washington to give the American people a dollar's worth of government and charge them 76 cents for it. It is the principal instrument by which politics is made easy by certain choices being evaded. And then there was something I'd already referred to, which is the nature of the modern presidency. I'm convinced that the presidency has achieved its peculiar role because of an accident, that two things arrived almost simultaneously in the late 40s, the Cold War and television. The Cold War made the president the center of a nonstop, 24-hour-a-day, year-round melodrama in a hair-trigger world, high-tension world, with Soviet missiles eight minutes away on submarines off North Carolina, with the military aid carrying the satchel with the launch codes behind the president wherever he went. Uh, the president became the focus of an abnormal and inherently unhealthy obsession on the part of the American people, deepened by television which exists to, which being slave to a superficial news gathering instrument, a camera, must personalize politics, and the president suited that need terrifically. In one of the, the, the nice carom shots of American history, or of world history really, the crumbling of the Berlin Wall has begun to bring the presidency back down to human scale and to make the revival of Congress uh, much more possible than it recently has been. But in order for Congress to play the role it does, something must be done to stop what I consider uh, supply-side politics in Washington. Uh, by that, I refer to the process by which groups do not demand programs, thereby producing programs, but programs are developed to invent groups that will thereafter rally around them and become reliable constituencies for those who write the programs. Take two examples that are familiar and have recently as a result of some monomania on the part of me and some others, become sort of mildly famous, the honey subsidy and the wool subsidy. Most Americans, of course, have a clue that we have a wool subsidy and would wonder why we do. The reason we do is World War II was fought largely in wool uniforms. And shortly after the Second World War, the military, confronted with the possibility of another two-front war, said we'd better subsidize the growing of wool. Cold War is over. Alternative fabrics have come along, and the wool subsidy goes on and on. Somewhat limited as a result of recent hullabaloo's, but on and on. Same reason we have a honey subsidy. During the Second World War, honey was valued as a sugar substitute and as a way of, of uh, waterproofing munitions. War is over. 
But the hunting subsidy has two more years to run when they say, and I don't believe a word of it, they will phase it out. Not that the bees wouldn't make honey even if they weren't civil servants, but we're going <laughs> to test that. This is what I call supply-side politics. I actually, if I can just continue this digression one minute more. My, my, sort of the final last straw in my conversion on term limits came about 6.30 one morning in Denver. I don't know why I was there. I got up and I opened the Rocky Mountain News, saw a headline about basketball. I had written a column uh, about the Midnight Basketball League in Chicago, a wonderful program run entirely by the private sector in which young at-risk inner city men aged 17 to 24 are got off the street and out of trouble and into basketball uniforms, leagues, award banquets, referees, the whole scene. They play basketball in the middle of the night, keeps them out of trouble. Good idea. I wrote a column about it, big mistake. Because in Washington, the assumption is that every good idea should be a federal program. <laughs> and what the headline said in, um, in, in the Rocky Mountain News was Congresswoman Patricia Schroeder gets federal grant for Midnight Basketball League. At that moment, I was reading, because I was going to review it for the New York Times book review, a biography of Henry Clay, and I was just serendipitously at the point where Henry, young Henry Clay fights his way out of the Kentucky wilderness and over the corduroy roads and by barge up the rivers into Washington in 1806. And the day he arrives, Jefferson is having a spat with Congress because Congress has passed a Rhodes Bill to build a bridge over the Potomac River. And Jefferson reluctantly and against his better instincts says, all right, I'm going to sign this. But I have looked in the Constitution under the enumerated powers and nowhere does it say Congress should run around building bridges over the Potomac. He said, I'll sign it anyway, but if you're not careful and if you don't mend your ways, in 150 years you're going to be subsidizing basketball in Denver. <laughs> Uh, word, words, words to that effect. Uh, and I decided that, that term limits would be a, a rational response. Now, when I, in advocating term limits, uh, I don't want to say that term limits will make something straight from the crooked timber of humanity. It won't. But I do insist, as I say, it is a Madisonian measure. It is an accommodation to human nature and, most importantly, to the nature of the modern state. Do not favor term limits because you expect this or that particular policy outcome, because I don't know what the policy outcome would be. A lot of supporters of term limits say, if you have term limits, you will reduce federal spending. I don't know that that's true, and there's a good reason to doubt it, because today, under Congress as currently constituted, the strongest political passion, arguably the only strong political passion in the country, is taxophobia. And that taxophobia is rooted in a pandemic distrust of the motives and discretion of the Congress. Term limits will, I think, rehabilitate Congress and will therefore be a precondition, a necessary precondition, for ending uh, the, the severe uh, reluctance to pay taxes. Do not support term limits in the anticipation of any particular predictable partisan outcome between Republicans and Democrats. The recent history of competition for open seats suggests that the Democrats will do slightly better than Republicans for open seats, for a lot of reasons, but basically because Democrats like being in government and Republicans would rather work for IBM, which is why they're Republicans. The one clear, reasonably clear effect term limits would have would be to increase the number of women and minorities in politics for, I think, obvious reasons. As I've said, do not be for term limits because you want to punish Congress or shove it more to the periphery of American life. It will have, I think, the opposite effect by bringing into politics and into Congress people who come often from established careers to which they can return and who therefore do not face the prospect of risk and elective defeat as personal and emotional and vocational annihilation, whose identity is not tied up as most poignantly and pathetically you see, for example, in Bob Packwood with clinging to public office, you would, I think, have a less risk averse and therefore more assertive, more uh, decisive, bolder Congress, not least a Congress bold in standing up to the entrenched and permanent government in the bureaucracy. But most of all, 
most of all, and here I, I am uh, diametrically opposed to most of my friends in the term limits movement, do not be for term limits in order to make Congress, as they say, more responsive. The problem today in American life is that Congress is far too responsive. It is an institution incapable of saying no. It is a finely tuned seismograph quivering to every tremor of organized appetite in the country. And the point of term limits, as I envision it, is to establish what Professor Mansfield calls constitutional distance between the elected and the, uh, uh, the electors, to make room to give motives and to give emotional and psychic space for the elected to deliberate. Now, in this sense, term limits is just a modern version of a very old American concern with understanding the sociology of virtue. It's as old as Jefferson worrying about cities. It's as old as Hamilton worrying about a, a landed squirearchy in the South. This is an attempt to give Republican representative institutions a certain character, a certain cast, certain attributes. This is why, by the way, uh, I think the litigation that began in Seattle the other day is going to establish that, in fact, states do have the constitutional power by state action to limit the terms of congressmen and senators because the courts have traditionally for 200 years been very deferential to many state efforts to restrict access to the ballot and restrict and regulate candidacies in the interests of such sometimes competing values as political openness and political stability. Tom Foley says, you, Anything other than the three qualifications listed in the Constitution is unconstitutional. That is, you have to be a certain age, have to be an American citizen, have to live in the state. The state, by the way, that's all it says. All kinds of states have laws as well as customs that say you have to live in the congressional district. And the Constitution doesn't have a word in it about congressional districts. When Tom Foley runs for office every two years, he goes in and signs an oath that he is a registered voter. The state of Washington has a law saying you must be a registered voter to be a congressman. That's nowhere in the Constitution. All kinds of states have laws that say if you're going to run for Congress, you can't hold certain other offices. It's not in the Constitution. There are all kinds of restrictions on voter choices and politicians' options that already exist. The term limits would be simply another one of those. Congress is, is reforming Congress is so particularly interesting to those with a a bent toward political philosophy, because Congress being the locus of popular sovereignty in the United States is the locus of the modern political problem. The old political problem was thought to be the tension between the ruler and the ruled. And for a while, people thought popular sovereignty solved all those problems. But the sovereign people themselves can, it turns out, be a problem, particularly when, as de Tocqueville warned, uh, you have a compassionate and solicitous government that degrades men without tormenting them, in de Tocqueville's language. It degrades them by kindness, by courting them, by supply-side politics in part. The attempt is to produce in Washington a political class and an institution capable of deliberation as opposed to the mere registering of interests. I'm fascinated, again, it seems to me we've just listened to common language of our lives. We learn so much. The word clout is one of the most common and defensive words used in American political discourse because it assumes, it postulates, it teaches that politics is a collision of forces. No persuasion, one clout is bigger than another clout, is how you settle arguments. And indeed, that is how it works too much. But in fact, by changing the way we select the people who staff our institutions, we can acknowledge the fact that political virtues are not natural, they are nurtured, they are the product of artifice, and term limits is a Madisonian artifice. By working on the institution, you will affect the workings of the institution. To make it possible in Madison's language in Federalist 10, for the institutions better to refine and enlarge public opinion. That's what the founders thought representatives were to do, to add reason to mere willfulness, 
That is what you are more apt to get, I believe, if you have people who do not come but for sojourns. Now, America not about government. They, have, they are the children and bed, and here I boulderize in the presence of is a nuisance to cope with necessary, but not terribly necessary, because people are mildly social, but they need, as I say, they have inconveniences in a state of nature without a state. So there is built into America a literally congenital, from birth, distrust. Term limits will raise the trustworthiness of government. fall off at this point because they are of the scorched earth so salt and pute is to be welcomed. <laughs> I side, however, with Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 68 when he said the true test of good government is its aptitude and tendency. Listen to the temperate language they use. The aptitude and tendency, not the certainty, the aptitude and tendency to behave reasonably. Ah, but some people say, aren't term limits anti-democratic? Well, they are if the First Amendment is anti-democratic, if the first eight amendments, which are shall not amendments. Is it anti-democratic to refuse to the people the right through their elected representatives to establish religion or bridge freedom of speech? I don't think so. It is part of the way we structure free government and popular sovereignty. It is passing strange, I may say, in passing, for opponents of term limits to say that they're opposed to term limits because they so passionately believe in the unfettered right of people to vote, when these very people will not allow term limits to come to a vote in Congress, will not allow it to come to the floor of the House of Representatives. Every year, term limits to the House Judiciary Committee, which is chaired by Jack Brooks, who has been in Congress since God was a child and is himself <laughs> is himself an eloquent argument for term limits, and there it dies. <laughs> in the Senate, where, uh, where it is less easy to bottle things up, uh, term limits first came to a vote in 1948. It got one vote, that of the man who introduced it. About three years ago, term limits got 30 votes. Last time around, it got 39 votes. As I say, I think the tide is is, uh, is running strongly. There are others who say, well, uh, you don't need term limits. The key is campaign finance reform. There are two problems with that. The terrible campaign finance rules that we have now, at least the people who say campaign finance reform is the key say they're terrible. The campaign rules we have now were written by incumbents. The next set of rules will, by definition, be written by incumbents, and they will not be written to handicap incumbents. Furthermore, all campaign finance rules, in my judgment, that restrict either political spending or giving are, by the logic of the Supreme Court, unconstitutional because they ration the permissible amount of political speech. That's my view. The Supreme Court lags behind me in this on so many other matters. but. Uh, <laughs> I think we'll come around one of these days. Uh, it was finally said that, that uh, and I'm really just touching on these things so we can argue about them in a moment, it is said that government is so complicated nowadays that uh, we need the expertise of people who've been there a very long time in order to run it. Two responses to that. One is maybe if that is what we need for that kind of government, we shouldn't have that kind of government, but I will pass that over. I will simply say that being a senator is far less demanding and far less complicated. Running a congressional committee, being a representative of any congressional district, far less demanding than being, say, Secretary of Health and Human Services or of the Interior, the Treasury, or Attorney General, anything else. And those executive branch departments, huge, sprawling, and consequential, are generally staffed by people who come to Washington from the private sector, stay four years or so and leave. So the idea of expertise seems to fail. Today already we have 15 states 
have enacted term limits. Those 15 states have 40% of the American population. This year alone, Los Angeles in June, New York in November, the two largest cities in the United States voted term limits. Congress, by refusing to allow this to be debated, to be voted on, to be sent to the states as a constitutional amendment for debate and decision, runs the risk of delegitimizing itself even more than it already is. Now, I do not quite side with Bill Buckley and his celebrated statement that he would rather be governed by the first 400 names in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the Harvard faculty. I think that <laughs> went a bit too far. Uh, but it is the case that the American people are uh, sometimes looking at, at Congress feel that way. I would like to restore to American life some of the cheerful uh, malcontentery of the man who, for whom I cast my first presidential vote, Barry Goldwater, who, when he first entered politics in 1952, said to a friend, it ain't for life uh, uh, give you as a, in a baseball language with which I'm most comfortable. Uh, 88. The Orioles were a lot like Congress. They were old, expensive, and incompetent. <laughs> they lost their first 21 games in a row and went on to lose 107 games. Not genius. We can lose 107 games with cheap rookies. <laughs> the, uh, the 1989 Orioles had the youngest team in baseball, the small smallest payroll in baseball and American League East, and that, in very short compass, is the case for term limits. Thank you very much. Professor Fiorina, and then we'll have questions, and if you have a question, please approach a microphone. Thank you. Talk about a hard act to follow. Even knowing that, I jumped at the chance to participate tonight. About six years ago, when I opened the Christmas present for my parents, I found George F. Will the morning after. I figured I'd get an autograph before I leave tonight. <laughs> a few years later, I opened the Christmas present, and it was statecraft as soulcraft. I believe they paid full price uh, even for that. <laughs> and I was going to get that autograph, but it's missing from my shelf, undoubtedly stolen by a graduate student, as so many of our books are. <laughs> and, and just about three years ago, I opened my birthday present for my sister and found George F. Will, Men at Work. And I don't need this one autograph because realizing the priority I attached to baseball vis-a-vis -vis politics, my sister stood in line and got this one autograph. So. <laughs> Given this familial admiration for George Will, I would really like to stand here tonight and say I agree with everything that he said and written. And I do, in fact, agree with a lot. I agree that all too often in our legislatures, both state and national, special interests are allowed to run rampant, both local interests and organized group interests, with consequent damage to the national interest and to their legitimacy in the eyes of the citizens. I think it would be a good thing uh, to bring more amateurs into politics and also to strengthen the deliberative process in our legislatures. But I disagree that term limits is a solution. And at least I have the consolation of doing so from a classically conservative position, which is, although the situation is awful, probably term limits would make it worse. So let me take a few minutes to explain my skepticism, and then I'd say a few words about what I see as the larger problem and the difficulty in doing much about it. In the first half of uh, his book, Restoration, which I recommend to all of you, uh, George Will makes a very hard and I think fair criticism of Congress. And along the way, he also uh, trashes a few people like CEOs and heads of nonprofit institutions, whom I agree, they richly deserve it as well. Uh, he, he summarizes the argument as follows. Members of Congress, CEOs, heads of nonprofit institutions, all these have come to be seen as examples of people corrupted by being insulated from competition and accountability. 
people committed to nothing much other than their own continuation in office, people whose hold on their office depends on their manipulation of the power of their offices and the resources to which their offices give them access. Regarding members of Congress, term limitation is the surgical remedy. So there are three claims made here. The first is that members of Congress are insulated and unaccountable. Most people who study Congress think that's wrong. The second claim is that members are exceedingly interested in re-election. I think that's certainly true, but it's not in itself a serious problem. And third is that members manipulate, if not abuse, their power and resources. I agree with that as well, but I just don't think term limits is going to stop it. So considering these in order, first, the, the idea of being insulated. On the contrary, people who study Congress agree that the members are almost obsessed with elections, that many members, at least most members. It's surprising even how obsessed senators are uh, with elections. House primaries, it's understandable. I mean, they're facing primaries all, shortly a year after their, uh, their um, uh, first elected officer, first sworn in. We look at their victory rates, 90 to 95 percent victory rates, and it's deceptive. We infer that, well, because they're so successful, they really don't have anything to worry about. But that's like looking at a hitter like Tony Gwynn and saying that because he's a 360 hitter or was, uh, he doesn't need to practice. In fact, as, as George Will argues in the book and shows in the book, he is a 360 hitter because of the time and effort and dedication he puts into it. And most members think if they quit, if they let down, in fact, they would be in danger. The problem with Congress is not the insulation of its members. The problem with Congress is there's a lack of insulation. Members are responsive to everyone with a dollar or a vote, and as George Will said just a few moments ago in his talk, this makes the Congress accountable to thousands of special interests, but not the nation. Now, the second claim that they're re-election seekers, yes, but it's not a bad thing in itself. As Joseph Schlesinger wrote some years ago, no more irresponsible government is imaginable than one composed of high-minded men unconcerned for their political futures. Would we want legislatures that were full of true believers? Would we want people coming to office and saying, I don't care about re-election. I want to do the right thing about fill in the blanks, abortion, gay rights, taxing the rich, spreading human rights throughout the world. That the electoral process tends to weed out true believers, tends to weed out zealots, and tends to constrain what they do once they're in office. And if you're not satisfied with that sort of practical reason, I'd make the, uh, the more philosophical argument that the electoral ambition is one of the threads that holds the constitutional fabric together. The framers realized that this complicated institutional structure they had constructed was merely, there were merely demarcations on parchment, the phrase they use, unless it was buttressed in some way. It was to be buttressed by pitting ambition against ambition, by connecting the interests of the man with the constitutional rights of the place. And if you look on, look further, you find that the ambitions they were talking about, the interests they were talking about, were to a considerable extent these kinds of political and electoral ambitions we're talking about. The real problem is not re-election seeking. The real problem is that more than any time in our history, re-election is now largely disconnected from advancing general interests in this country. And that has to do with the weakening of parties, the erosion of presidential coattails, the rise of this kind of entrepreneurial argument uh, of politics that we professors drone on and on about in the courses you take from us. The third claim that members manipulate their offices and resources, yes, but how would term limits change that? The sixth term limit, which is the, the most common proposal, still provides incentive to do it five times. And in the final term, if anything, I think things would be worse. Now, Joe Kennedy is uh, going to run for re-election for his fifth term uh, this coming fall. Would Kennedy be any more or less likely to be seeking the national interest if he were facing a six-term limit? He might very well have decided to take on George, uh, take on um, Go Governor Weld after all, in which case, rather than just dispersing favors and benefits to the 8th District, he'd be doing it all over the state of Massachusetts. Or perhaps he would uh, decide to sit out a few years and uh, fill in Uncle Teddy's seat when, uh, when that was vacant, in which case perhaps he'd be negotiating with some neighboring institution about earmarking $10 million for, say, a study for the a Center for the Study of the Public Interest with Joe Kennedy as first director. Harvard would never take money under those circumstances, of course, but many of our neighboring institutions uh, might. In short, I mean, we worry now about revolving doors and incestuous relationships of various kinds. I think those worries would be much worse if, in fact, we had members every, at, at a maximum of every 12 years, looking for where they were going to land. The point is, these people have no farms or ranches to go back to, as they did 100 years ago. They don't even have law practices or insurance agencies to go back to, as they might have had a generation ago. They are not just career legislators. They are career politicians. Now, at this point, the advocate of term limits might say, well, that's, that's the problem, so why aren't you with us? The question is, would term limits change that in any way? What kinds of people would be likely to serve in term-limited legislatures? 
Uh, for the term limit advocates, uh, they're very optimistic. They think that there would be an infusion of public spirited amateurs who would breathe fresh air into the system. George Will writes, term limits would increase the likelihood that people would come to Congress from established careers with significant experience in the private sector. I'd love to see that, but I doubt it. In this day and age, when young two-income families are reluctant to take vacations they have coming, when women are reluctant to take three months maternity leaves because they can't take away, time away from careers, how many kinds of people really would realistically be likely to take two years, four years, et cetera, out for these careers in politics? College professors could. Harvard gives us two years, other institutions give you more. So I think Mr. Will would agree with me that that would not uh, improve the, uh, the legislatures of this country. Uh, <laughs> journalists are probably free to do that, but nothing personal. I don't think that would necessarily improve the, uh, the legislatures of this country either. There are various occupational groups, the independently rich, uh, senior citizens, uh, students might think, especially in state legislatures, I'll serve two or four years before I go to law school. That's another argument against it. <laughs> but mostly, I think the kinds of people wouldn't change very much. And I think the extent that it did, that'd be for the worse. We would get more zealots. We would get more true believers. People who would say, I'm willing to gamble my career or sacrifice the welfare of my family to do what's right on fill in the blanks, whatever issue you're so, uh, you're, so, you're so concerned with. But also, I think, would still have a lot of professional politicians. There would be more mobility, that's true. They would be going up and down and across offices and so forth, much as they did in the 19th century. The, the idea that the 19th century was the heyday of amateur politics and it was full of Mr. Chips or Mr. Smith goes to Washington, uh, sure, there was some of that. But there were also, if you studied the career patterns, there was also quite a lot of simply moving, off, moving around offices. There wasn't the same incentive to stay in one office, but there was still definitely a political class, a career class. And I think that we tend to be the same case under term limits today. So if term limits won't change appreciably, the prevalence of careerists and professionals in politics, then why take the risk? that other people see of weakening legislatures, of strengthening interest groups, and so forth. See, the basic problem is not careerism or professionalism per se, but the fact that these factors aren't checked in any way. The framers wanted to check and channel this kind of ambition so as to contribute to the public interest. But today, local interests and organized group interests are pursued well beyond the point at which the national interest suffers, well beyond the point at which short-term interests dominate long-term interests. And I think we're stuck with these career legislators. We, don't, we can't get away from them. So the question becomes, how do we change their behavior? How do we induce them to weight the national interest more heavily? How do we induce them to take a longer uh, term view? It's a tough question, and frankly, I don't have an answer. That's the one, the one point I think where critics of term limits are, are just on, a, on weak grounds. We don't have a, an answer. There are various institutional fix-ups that have been proposed. Lloyd Cutler, you recall, after his experience in the Carter administration, wanted a team ticket where the presidential, vice presidential, senatorial, and House candidates all ran in the same ticket. You couldn't split your ticket. You know, and he felt that would produce a much more of a national uh, thrust in the system. It would, of course, it's totally impractical and would probably proliferate the number of parties. You could have an item veto. I wouldn't be opposed to that. But the only device that democ democracies have ever evolved for trying to induce people to take a longer term and take a more collective uh, view of their responsibilities is political parties. Much of our problem reflects their weaknesses, and I see no practical way to go back to any, any era in which parties were stronger than today. Now, would the world end if term limits were adopted? No, I don't think so. I think that the arguments for term limits are optimistic. I think that the arguments against term limits are exaggerated uh, in, in their own way. I'm not sure things would change uh, all that much. I, I think probably, in a sense, it would be a wash. For the most part, we're just offering opinions. They're informed opinions, but we're slinging opinions around. And given that that's the case, it seems to me the proper conservative prescription is to do some studying. We have, in fact, now a series of laboratories or a series of experiments going on in the country. We've adopted term limits in various states. And to simply introduce the first question, wouldn't the proper conservative prescription be to step back for a few years, maybe a decade, look and see what happens in California and other states do the members change? Uh, do the kinds of internal structures, the policy making change, relationships with the gubernatorial offices and so forth? And simply get some more information before we, we roll this reform on to other legislatures. Thank you. To begin with your question, yes, and we have no choice but to do that because Jack Brooks is there making sure there will be at least a decade. I'm quite sure it'll be at least a decade until you could have a constitutional amendment. Meanwhile, California particularly will be what Brandeis called the state's function of a laboratory of liberty. We're going to learn a lot about the empirical questions you rightly raise. 
what kind of person wants to go to Sacramento now under these under strict term limits. We're going to find out. And uh, uh, perhaps by the time Jack Brooks uh, is overridden by, uh, by either nature or, uh, <laughs> or public opinion, we'll, we'll have second thoughts. I mean, I, I, the people I, I know are, uh, are open to this possibility that, that things can get worse. Uh, I, I, I do find, if I just go down a few of the things you said, I do find it a non sequitur when people say, uh, congressmen aren't vulnerable, uh, uh, must be vulnerable, otherwise they wouldn't be so obsessed with getting reelected. That's just a non sequitur. The reason so many of them are not vulnerable is their obsession, that they think of, of very little else. It is interesting that Senate, you said even senators are vulnerable. Senators are more vulnerable than a, a house because a, a house district, 435,000 people, something like 500,000, is much easier to massage and control and manipulate than a, than a state is. Uh, it's, it's a curious thing that the, what the founding fathers expected, which was a more turbulent turnover in the house, is now really an attribute of the Senate. Uh, it's curious to me that, that uh, someone looks upon 12 years as an inadequate sojourn. That's a very long time in, in, uh, in uh, one institution and can be just a part of a much longer public career. Uh, with regard to who's going to come and who's going to know the private sector, one of the poignant stories of American politics in recent years <coughs> concerns George McGovern who after he lost in 1980 went out and did a number of things. Among the things is he bought a inn and restaurant in Connecticut and it failed. No disgrace in that. Most new businesses fail. Certainly most new restaurants fail. No disgrace. But what interested me was that George McGovern said he was dumbfounded, he said, by the government paperwork and burdens that had been piled upon private businessmen. And he said, why didn't anyone tell me? Well, living out there tells you if you have some other job. And it seems to me that uh, it is perfectly possible to expect people uh, to come to Washington from jobs and to have jobs to go back to. Uh, the, uh, this may, by the way, as uh, you or someone else at dinner pointed out, require us to change some of the laws, the foolish laws in my judgment, that require people in public life to shed all alternative means of s support and to, and to, in a sense, lock themselves into a position that makes them desperate to cling to office. That would be a good companion reform. But uh, he and I have bombarded you quite enough, and so if anyone has any questions, there are the microphones. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Allen. I'm an undergraduate here. Um, I was wondering how you would respond to um, Sam Donaldson's comment that we do have term limits in the sense that we have elections. So why is it necessary that we have, um, like, a constitutional amendment? There are 435 congressional districts. After uh, the 1990 election, the most recent one for which I've seen the figures, Common Cause or one of those groups did a study and they broke them down into this. They said, first, take all the people who were literally unopposed. There were about 73 that year with no opposition whatever. <clears throat> then they had a second category, virtually unopposed. These were people who had an opponent, but the opponent raised less than $25,000 average spending for a congressional seat that year was between four and six hundred thousand dollars. And then a third category we said essentially unopposed or something like that. These were the people whose opponents had less than half the money the incumbent had. The others were competitive races. You know how many there were? Twenty three. Twenty three. Now the, the fact is that's why a lot of people say, well, the alternative is campaign finance reform, and I think there are institutional and constitutional hurdles to, uh, to that. Thanks. My name is Erin Ahmed. I'm an undergrad here in the government department, and I wanted to get your opinion on a provision that Massachusetts voters are going to be voting on next fall. It's sponsored by a term limit support group in Massachusetts called Limits 2, and that would do something that I haven't read about in any other states. It would um, has two provisions that would apply to state legislators. The first is that after eight years, it wouldn't bar anybody from gaining re-election, re but you'd have to do it as a write-in candidate. And the second provision is that it would take away your pay and perquisites. And it strikes me that that, um, 
and I'd like to hear your response on this, that, it, that that would just help to re-entrench um, wealth and those who those members who are most influential. It seems that it seems a strange vessel for term limit supporters to be using to pass because it strikes me that the only members who would be able to continue serving are those who are most offensive to supporters <coughs> of limits. That's right. I mean, it, it, you you raised an absolutely chilling specter of government by assistant professors, and we don't want to have a <laughs> we don't want to have government by the the idle rich. You're right. So I mean, the attack on perquisites looks punitive and should not be part of this movement. With regard to uh, leaving open a write-in campaign, that, by the way, is how the Washington Initiative was written. That is, it, it, the Washington Initiative that's being litigated and raises all the issues of term limits is, strictly speaking, a ballot access limit. It simply says, after so many years, you can't be on the ballot until you've been out of office for a while. So no one is, A, permanently barred from an, any particular institution, and no one is ever barred from the ballot because you can run a write-in campaign. But uh, it's, it's, I think they've done the same thing in Florida with regard to the write-ins, and that I find unobjectionable. You had, there's one other point I wanted to comment on. Um, I'll think of it. Sorry. Thank you. Um, hello there, um, Mr. Will. My name is Diallo Riddle, and I'm a freshman um, at Harvard College. Um, my question was this. This is just my concern. Um, if you institute the uh, term limits, it um, seems like you're going to have a Congress full of, um, full of effectively freshmen, um, freshman congressmen. A lot of times when these people first get into Congress, they're they're very opinionated, and the things that they want most to change are their, their primary goals. Uh, with a lot of opinionated um, first-timers in office, um, will term limits have an effect on compromise? Um, because very well, if you've just gotten to Congress, you may not be so quick to uh, hear the other side of the story. Um, Turns out we've had a little experience with that this year because of the bank scandal <clears throat> and because of the postal scandal and because of a provision in the law that allowed people to retire and take with them for private use campaign countries. For a lot of reasons, we've had some turnover. This is a very big freshman class this year. What has amazed people in Washington is how little difference it made because they came with the, the motive of careerists to get along with the system. They blended in perfectly. One reason for which is that about 75% of the freshmen who came came from legislative offices, from city councils or state legislatures. So this was just a career move of people in this vocation. So it's made very little difference in terms of the kind of person coming and the motives they had because they can still hope to make a lifetime career there. Uh, there is no question, I'm not denying that there is a problem with institutional memory in a place like the Senate or the House. That is a cost, unquestionably a cost, of term limits. All I'm saying is it's worth paying. Every reform has costs. This is one of them, and I'm ready to take that. Well, I, I remember what I was going to say to, to the lady over here, and that is that Will's reform. It's an alternative to term limits. It's Will's pension reform. And it is that everyone uh, who comes to Congress can retire after one term with a million dollars a year pension. The second term, you can retire with $800,000 a year. <laughs> After five terms, you know who loves their country. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Will. My name is Charlie Wu, and I'm an undergraduate here, and I've taken Professor Fury in his class. So uh, my, my question to you is actually, I'm from Los Angeles, California, and it seems that in one of the open seats for one of the open congressional seats coming up, the front runners in, in the race already are, is a banking consultant from the Valley and another investment banker from another area. And I was wondering that following Ross Perot's lead and Richard Reardon's, that the lessons that people are learning now is that the stepping stone to politics is really money and that money talks. And I was wonder, wondering what, how term limits would affect that kind of attitude, whether it would breed that. Uh, read the money, money to attitude, that kind of stuff. I'm not sure I've, I've got the question. I mean, will, it, will term limits change the role of money in electoral process? The answer right. is no. The, it, it will complicate uh, the task of givers because there are going to be so many open seats. I mean, right now, 
the big recipients of organized groups are incumbents, which means Democrats get more money than Republicans, which is one partisan motive that Republicans have in the short term for supporting term limits. But uh, so I think you'd have a, you'd have a you'd, you'd have a nervous breakdown in the giving classes in Washington if they actually had to pick uh, who to support. Right now, it's easy just support the incumbents. But I don't. I, say, I do not see. I, I think the Supreme Court was correct when it said that in politics, money is speech. They just haven't followed the logic of that uh, declaration and leaving it free. If I were, I mean, I, I, the only campaign law I would have uh, is no cash and full disclosure, and I'm not sure of full disclosure anymore, in part because of a lesson of the term limits movement. I know that uh, all kinds of people in businesses doing business with the government come to term limits people and say, uh, I'd love to contribute, but I dare not have full dis have disclosure of that I've supported this because there will be punishment. There's clearly a chilling effect of full disclosure in this instance. Mr. Will, my name is Chris Frank. I'm an undergrad at the college. Um, how would you respond to the contention that any state which unilaterally imposes term limits on its representatives in Congress under the current seniority system immediately loses all the advantages of having a congressman who's been there for 20 years, even if they don't agree with everything that congressman thinks. They do uh, suffer exactly that injury, which is what ma ma which makes it all the more remarkable that 15 states have chosen to do it anyway. California, tremendously dependent on the federal government for water and defense and all the rest, did it anyway. State of Washington. Uh, the federal government owns about 48% of the land in the state of Washington. It's very important in the electric power generation state. Did it anyway. Which tells you something about the appeal of the issue. Because there's no question that, that this is, in a sense, unilateral disarmament. <laughs> now, Missouri, Missouri, if I've got the, if I remember this right, Missouri passed term limits with a trigger in it that says ours will go into effect when 25 states have done it. So that's a sort of flinch. Thank but, you. Uh, it's a, it's a real problem. Mr. Well, my name is Manuel Lopez. I'm from the law school. I have a question. This all seems to some extent to be like a Rube Goldberg scheme, that uh, it's a device to uh, somehow keep the voters from doing what they would naturally do, which would be something bad, which is keep these rotten uh, careers legislators in and uh, let the whole slow process of decline continue. Um, and maybe, maybe the criticism is really to begin with Madison, which Watch the adventure it. of all these Rube Goldberg, Rube Goldberg schemes in uh, government. Uh, but uh, it seems to me, couldn't one, an objection would be that, although this might make a minor improvement, and, uh, and perhaps we have to wait till the experiments come out in the states, it seems to me, to the extent that people concentrate on these band-aids, and these uh, schemes, uh, their, the attention is uh, moved away from the main problems, the main issue, which is the source of the problem. That is, uh, the fact that the rulers are bad. I mean, that the people actually want a, a buck in the social services and, and want this largest and want to pay only 70 cents. The fact that uh, the whole money orientation, you know, in, uh, uh, well, in law, which is, uh, mm -hmm. which is what uh, I'm getting unpleasantly familiar with now, the, uh, um, <coughs> these huge awards uh, that people seek. You know, this, uh, for instance, in the uh, radiation problems. Uh, the, uh, instead of expecting the government to apologize yeah. and correct the abuses, people want these millions and billions of dollars. Yes, uh, that, would not, 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 that would not be changed. But you know, when you talk about Rube Goldberg, usually refers to something of comic complexity. Whatever else term limits is, is not complicated. It's extremely simple. You can write it on a postcard. Uh, but there's an indirectness to it. You know, why not attack the problem it. head on? This, is, well, by what this what term limits does is remove completely the dominating motive for action in Washington, which is careerism. It just takes that motive out. And by cutting down that huge shade tree will allow, we hope, this empirical question, we uh, will allow lovelier motives to flourish 
where hitherto the shade kept them from flourishing. Now, we'll see. We'll see about that. But this is not complicated. Uh, and it is not uh, trivial in the case of, of, again, sort of banishing a dominant motive. Uh, you are right. Look, the American, I think one of the reasons for the very strength of the term limits movement, poll after poll confirms what voting after voting proves. More than 70% of the American people say they favor term limits. Majorities in both parties, both sexes, all ethnic groups, all regions. In New York, whites favored term limits. Blacks favored term limits more. Hispanics favored them most of all. Now, why? Because you say, it, it's paradoxical, because they keep sending these guys back, and they're saying, in a sense, stop me before I kill again. <laughs> but they are saying that. They are, they, I think the American people feel they're playing a game by the rules, and they're going to continue to play by these rules, but it's a corrupting like just corrupt a corrupting game, and they'd like to call a halt. And I think it's admirable. It's not uh, it, it's not contradictory. It's uh, it's just people wrestling with the real dilemma that they're in a system and they want to make a transition, and it's admirable. Hello, my name is Avery Gardner. I'm a freshman at the college, and given that so many Supreme Court justices are appointed at such an early age that they can serve for 40 years or more. I'd like to know your opinion on term limitations for Supreme Court justices. I'm against it. Uh, they do not dispose of power in a way that is, consists of an auction for public favor. So they don't, the mechanism that makes term limits necessary doesn't obtain. You've exaggerated, <coughs> excuse me, just a tad. There aren't that many 40-year <laughs> justices, and a, a justice in his late 40s is pretty young. Uh, but. Uh, I take your point, but no, I'm, I'm against that. A more common complaint that my friend Henry Hyde throws at me whenever he sees me is there ought to be term limits for columnists. Uh, <laughs> and that's arguable. Um, the difference, as I throw back at him, is that when I participate in making coercive laws backed by the police power of the, of the United States, then I should be limited. But as I can testify eloquently and from firsthand experience, there's virtually no power in being a columnist. <laughs> uh, my name is Trey Grayson. I'm a senior at the college. And my question refers to a different type of term limits, term limits on committee chairs. Earlier, you cited a drawback of general term limits in general that you would lose people like Senator Moynihan and Senator Danforth. But you also lose people like Congressman Brooks. Maybe that's not a bad thing. If you put term limits on committee chairs, wouldn't you be able to take advantage of maybe the statesmen that would still be around, and they would still be in the Senate or in the House, but they wouldn't have such dominant control over the committees, and that might break up some of this gridlock and provide uh, some of the advantages. Yes, of the it would, and I think I'm for it, and I think Congressman McCurdy and some others have suggested it. And uh, don't hold your breath. <laughs> but, uh, but it would be part of the same healthy rotation, yes. Hi, my name is Adrienne Wheatley. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. Speaking of non sequiturs, I'm wondering if you can explain to me how it necessarily follows that term limits would draw business people into Congress. There's nothing stopping them now from doing it. They have the money, and if they have the inclination, it seems to me that they'd do so. I, didn't, I hope I didn't indicate that it necessarily would. Uh, there's no necessity about it. Uh, I think it, it, you're, they're going to have to come from somewhere. We're going to have 435 members of Congress. And they're going to, they're not, the one thing that will happen after term limits is they're not going to come from people determined to make careers in the legislature. That's all. So they have to come from somewhere else. I'm not sure who will come. But we've had, as I say, the, the, the terrifying prospect of the very rich and the uh, academics. But, uh, uh, well, I don't know where they'll come from. Just doesn't seem to and again, be. we're going to have 10 years, as the professor hopes we have. We're going to have time to watch what happens in California and elsewhere. Right. There just doesn't seem to be any evidence that after imposing term limits, the people who go into Congress would be any different than the people who are there now. They'll just be there for a shorter amount of time. Well, it, it seems to me there's no evidence yet because we haven't had enough experience with it. But it does seem to me uh, counterintuitive to suppose that there would be no change in the kind of person who comes and and the places they'd come from, because they have different, they have to have different motives for coming in the first place. Mr. Will, this may be a related question. My name's uh, Al Peck. I'm a National Security Fellow here at the Kennedy School. 
Uh, when I see you doing battle with Sam Donaldson on Sunday morning or read your, your work in Newsweek, uh, such as the recent piece you did on the National Endowment of the Arts, I, I can't help but ask, you know, why, why aren't you on the Senate floor making uh, speeches like that? Uh, if Congress was full of uh, uh, those who were there for the love of government or love the country rather than uh, self-serving bureaucrats, uh, would you be inclined yourself to, to uh, run for office? Yeah, I might. But uh, first, I have the best job in America right now. And uh, second, I like to think it's not unrelated to a kind of public service. Third, I have a small family, I mean, small children. And uh, the dirty little secret of American politics is that so obsessive is the political life of the perpetual campaign that you say goodbye to your children. And the toll on families is insupportable and unacceptable to me. Fourth, I do not want to be a senator. Uh, fifth, I live in Maryland, and there are only two Republicans in Maryland. Uh, I'm, I'm one, and Gene Kirkpatrick is the other, and they, uh, so it, it's just not promising. Hi, Mr. Wilt. Uh, my name is Abram Klein, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School, and I'd really like to ask you about your views on the new ownership of the Baltimore Orioles, but maybe I'll wait till afterwards. Um, and I've come away from this... Uh, debate between a journalist and a professor uh, w without so much of a sense of, of where temp term limits would lead us. And, and we actually have here at the Kennedy School a distinguished lecturer who I would say is not a careerist but spend a lot of his career in Congress. And I was wondering, I'd be very interested to hear Mickey Edwards' views on term limits and whether they'd make a difference. And, and I don't know if that's he, a fair question or not. Well, when the evening began, he was still sunk in darkness, but that may have changed. Uh, <laughs> why don't you come on up and say well, thanks. Uh, Georgia, as I pointed out before, I, I am uh, living proof that uh, the voters uh, do have the opportunity and the wisdom to make changes in Congress. Uh, and they, they did so without, uh, without term limits. Uh, uh, and as George knows, I do not support term limits. I do have a considerable amount of fear that while Barry Goldwater, who I admired and who I voted for, uh, was correct that it might be fun and, uh, you know, something good to do. Uh, he was a man of inherited wealth. And I am quite concerned, as one of the other speakers said, that with the current laws which restrict the ability of people in public office to go back to careers, to have something to go back to, uh, that people who are either not very young or retired or very wealthy will be kept out of the system and we will have an elitist system. And I think that would be very bad. The, uh, uh, an elitist system, of course, is what we want in some sense, surely. I mean, the question of modern life is not whether an elite shall rule, but which elite. And what we're trying to do is, is change the nature of the elite that, that, in fact, does rule. Howard Baker, as you probably remember, was for uh, s limiting uh, congressional sessions to, I think, the end of June. He says, make people go back and be lawyers and run banks and um, run inns in Connecticut, for that matter. Um, I just, I deplore all the laws that, as you both rightly say, sort of disarm a, a legislator and, and make him absolutely dependent on continuing in office as on a life support system. Given, my name's Keith Hennessy, I'm a second year student here. Uh, given that it would probably never happen from Washington, would you see any differences in term limits uh, from the central from Congress as opposed to term limits imposed at the state level, which we'll probably see? I think, uh, I think because term limits affect, and this is the reason for them, affect the nature of the regime, that they are the sort of thing that ought to be done by national debate and continental decision. I would prefer to do it over Jack Brooks's objections. It can't be done. Now, there's a case for saying that, that as the founding fathers clearly anticipated, there's a, we ought to have sort of a healthy diversity in the way the states did this. You know, when the first 13 states voted in the first elections to Congress, five of them did it at large, didn't have congressional districts. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, so-called, was elected under a law in Virginia that required him to be, live in his district and be a freeholder, a property holder. Now, Foley thinks all these thinks the father of the Constitution was elected under an unconstitutional law. That's the logic of his argument. Uh, but I would prefer it to be done 
because it is as important as it is by uh, constitutional deliberation of the states. But uh, it's, it strikes that the, at the, there's, a, there's a gatekeeper there called the existing incumbents, and they won't let it happen. I think it's, uh, you want to take one more? Yeah, okay. Hi, my name is uh, Orrin I'm at the college. Uh, you spoke of imposing a constitutional uh, distance between the Congress and the people. Um, today we have like available communications and technology that wasn't available at the time of the founding fathers. Would you be opposed then to an e increased involvement of the people through like electronic plebiscites or something like yes. this? And the second question is uh, World Series next year. Sorry? The World Series next year, who's in it? Oh, the Orioles beat the Braves in yeah, four games to two. That's easy. <laughs> not, even, not even close. Uh, the, um, yes, I mean, I, I think the, the, all the Perot vision of, of, uh, of electronic deliberation, which is an oxymoron akin to Lebanese government, <laughs> that, uh, uh, is, is just a terrible idea. I was even opposed, this is how rigorous I am, I was opposed to televising the Senate and the House. I may still be, except it's so much fun and so good for my side to put these people on television. Uh, but uh, but uh, certainly the Perot vision is, uh, is a menace. Thank you very much.